and recent article of his is a parent in the Rolling Stone and the Village Voice. And he told me that he could tell you better about himself than I could. And I think that's probably true. <laughs> so please, please welcome Mr. Zeskin. <laughs> Uh, good morning. This is a big house, and it's going to be difficult to get us all going. But this is a workshop, not a speech. So in a workshop, you all work. <laughs> and I'm serious about that. Um, you all work. And so I hope that you've had your morning, you, I hope you've had your morning uh, coffee or whatever got your juices going. Come on in, sit down. There's seats over here if you want to sit in on this. And so if you came here and thought that you would sort of sleep through the first couple of minutes, and you're wrong. I get to sleep through the first couple of minutes, and you get to work. So I want to know why you're here. That's the first thing we do in a workshop, right? You all tell me why you came and what you expect to get out of this. And so I expect volunteers to raise their hand at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning and tell me why you came here. Some of you traveled many hundreds of miles. And if you don't volunteer and raise your hand, I will soon call on you. <laughs> so um, let's see some hands here. Grace. Uh, uh, I came So, Grace, who comes from Boundary County, for those of you who don't know, it's right near Ruby Ridge um, in northern Idaho. Right. Um, so she's concerned about it in her local community. She sees it in her local community. There was a gentleman over here, young. I'm from Casper, Wyoming, and uh, we have Pete Peters, but we export, we're glad to export his stuff. Uh, we don't consume much of it in Wyoming, and Wyoming actually is fairly quiet, but I honestly came here to hear you and, uh, and to see you because you didn't make it to McKendry College this summer when the United Church of Christ had a program. Oh, was I supposed to be there? <laughs> <laughs> it was a rough summer. Um, Pete's an old buddy of mine. Um, so, uh, so, all right, well, that's not a good reason to come and see me. Yeah. Uh, I am Michael Winkenberg. I teach political science in Germany at the University of Göttingen, and I do research on the extreme right in both Germany and the United States. And I take this conference as an opportunity to just learn about the various factions of the extreme right in this country. Various factions. And you know Antifa M? Do you know the Antifa M people? Antifa, yes. Antifa M? Okay. All right. Over here. Yeah. Um, I'm Brenda Hammond. I'm the president of the Barter County Human Rights Task Force, just south of, of Grace there. We have an organization in, in our locality that is is really tr attempting to mainstream a lot of uh, these radical kinds of views and cloak them in, um, in terms that are more palatable to um, appeal to a wider audience. So. I'm really interested in kind of understanding that strategy. Okay. The palatable, I'll just write palatable. I'll get one more here. Two more I'm going to get. This woman here, yeah. Yeah, I'm a public librarian here in Spokane, and I just have a personal interest because of the comments I get from the public about the Antifa movement. And I have a personal interest because of the comments I get from the public that seem to me to be coming from a population I wasn't expecting to come from. So it is like mainstreaming, and I'm totally shocked. Did I spell occurrence right? Okay. Um, here and then here. Hi, I'm a high school student in Bozeman, Montana, and I have run across some white supremacism, like among high school students and other people already in Florida. 
Okay, so we'll put everyday occurrence in the library and high school here and then back there. And then we'll we'll off. Hey, Will. Um, I have more or less specialized in looking at the Abbey Choice for the first one of the things that really struck me. Recently, we're looking at the Council of National Falls and seeing Jack Kemp sitting at the same table as the Full Institute of Revival and the U.S. Texas <coughs> Party. And I'm here to just hopefully to get it over. Yeah, I don't know if we're going to get that far close to the center, Bill, but um, <laughs> maybe we can have a conversation about it here. Yeah. I'm Frank Whitworth from Colorado Springs, where. Uh, Extremism is already the mainstream, yeah. but I would like to, uh, I'm interested in developing the threads between conservatives to the extreme. All right, we've got a lot of ground to cover this morning, and uh, about 50 minutes to do it, so um, we're going to try and move along pretty fast, um, if I can. Um, I thought I'd uh, start with a little story. Um, uh, I thought we'd start with a little story from um, that Susan heard me tell in Montana last week, so she'll have to forgive me. But um, it was 1987. It was June of 1987 in, in Marietta, Georgia. And um, uh, I was standing in a hotel room with a colleague of mine uh, taking names, and we were shooting photographs of various grand dragons and cyclops and sorted and sundry other uh, animals that were coming down this hotel walkway um, because uh, they were there to hear David Duke announce that he was going to run for president. Um, and it was, a, uh, it was a motley crew of uh, these Grand Dragons um, uh, who that evening had dressed up in their uh, Kmart best. Um, and uh, so they, they were there. Um, this is my Kmart best, um, and uh, they they were there. And down the down the hall comes um, two old friends of mine. Um, uh, one is uh, Don Black, uh, who was a Grand Dragon uh, for, for a while for the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, and uh, got indicted for trying to uh, got sent to jail for uh, trying to invade the uh, Caribbean island of the Dominica with a little Klan Nazi army back in the very early 80s. And the man that was with him, walking arm in arm with him, was an Atlanta lawyer um, named Sam Dixon. Uh, he's an old buddy of yours. Um, and uh, Sam was there because he was a uh, David uh, Duke uh, supporter and was also had a number of clients in the room, actually. Um, that's a laugh line. You're allowed to laugh in this presentation. <laughs> um, in fact, it's re uh, required to laugh in this. <laughs> Thank you very much. I was nervous there for a while. I thought you all were going to be a tough crowd. Um, so there comes uh, uh, Don Black, this uh, mer mercenary type, um, and his uh, uh, buddy, uh, Sam Dixon, coming down the track at this David Duke uh, Ku Klux Klan type gathering. Now, uh, fast forward here to uh, May uh, Memorial Day, 1993, and uh, Sam is in Atlanta again. Although he switched locations, instead of the north suburbs, he's now in the south suburbs at a hotel uh, near the airport. And uh, instead of uh, a room full of uh, Grand Dragons and Cyclops, what he's got is a room full of uh, professors and academics. And he's uh, acting um, as uh, the uh, master of ceremonies. Among the people that were there, I think it's important to um, point out, were some of the same people that were in the room that first time. Uh, Ed Fields, who's this uh, Nazi type, uh, Nazi clan type from the South. Um, some of the same, you know, sort of bad guys, but also uh, amongst them, and Sam, by the way, I should just point out, for those of you who have an interest in this, and I haven't lost you yet, have I? Okay. <laughs> Sam, I just might point out, run, ran a little outfit called the Georgia Institute for a Stalker Review, um, which is uh, dedicated to the proposition that the Holocaust didn't really happen. 
Now, the reason I say that is to say that here it is uh, se seven years later in 1993, six years later in 1993, in this other hotel room, and among the crowd, there are about 140 of them, is the bad guys, all the regular bad guys. But in addition, um, a Rabbi Meyer Schiller uh, with Sam, uh, a Rabbi Meyer Schiller from Yeshiva University High School in New York, um, uh, uh, Father uh, Tercelli, who's a professor at uh, Boston University, um, uh, Michael Levin, who's sort of infamous now, um, who's a professor at uh, City University of New York, um, and a host of other um, luminaries uh, from the academic world. And they were there to discuss um, uh, the same kinds of issues that were being discussed in the David Duke meeting, that is um, uh, the, uh, the superiority of white culture um, and the threat to that and white people generally and actually white genes, whatever they are, um, the genetic makeup of Northern Europeans, uh, although that's a pretty tough one. Um, <laughs> and uh, they were there to discuss this. And that was the same topic, roughly, that uh, David Duke had discussed six years later. Only the crowd was better. It was a better crew. Now, to me, that's sort of emblematic of this transition at a national level. Um, and uh, uh, I'm going to come back to some of the themes, I think, that happened in that Atlanta meeting and then the follow-up meeting in Louisville. But um, my, uh, my general point here in this workshop is, is contained in this story, which is that there has been this, I'm telling this, trying to do this real fast so we can have a good discussion afterwards, um, so that uh, there's been this transformation, I think, of one wing of the white supremacist movement. Now, that doesn't mean that it's in the entirety of the white supremacist movement. So I, I want to um, make that clear from the very beginning. Obviously, we're in, here in Spokane. We're uh, in the land of the bombers and the bank robbers. Um, and they exist all over the place. They're in, I'm from Kansas City. And there was a bombing and bank robbing crew down there called the Midwest Bank Robbers that knocked off about 22 banks um, in 18 months. and did did the same MO as the crowd that was doing the banks up here, and may have even known each other for all that. Um, certainly operated out of the same Aryan nations type of thing. So those, cr and the bombers of the Oklahoma City, et cetera, you all know that story. You're that, so I'm not here to tell you about that. I just want to bracket that off and say that there's another wing of this movement that's got some of the same goals. Um, and certainly the same set of ideas that motivate them, but um, have moved themselves from the m political margins of society over into uh, the mainstream. And we're going to discuss a little bit about what that means in terms of defining the mainstream. Um, now, this didn't happen all at once. It didn't happen overnight. And so I think it's useful for a moment to stop and uh, look at some of the instances um, where, uh, where some of this um, uh, has uh, begun to take place. And, uh, and I think I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them, but um, I think that it's, uh, it's useful to take a look at it. Um, uh, in northern Wisconsin, there was, in the uh, late 1980s, a struggle over treaty rights, over sovereignty, over the issue of Native American sovereignty and control of fishing. And um, uh, a nativist, racist, white movement um, dedicated to violently stopping uh, the Chippewa tribes from exercising their sovereignty, um, so the Chippewa nations from exercising their sovereignty um, arose and physically attacked en masse um, uh, these, um, these fishermen. Um, sometimes the rallies got as large as 2,000 people out on the docks trying to stop them. This was, in my opinion, um, something of a, uh, w this was in 88, 89. Um, this was something of a white insurgency. It was the first tip, I think, 
of something that was going on in the national mind um, in terms of a transference from the bombers and bank robber types as they moved it into the, the political mainstream. It was a local phenomenon. It didn't have a big national impact, but it was an instance, I think, where um, everybody, not everybody, but there was a white, uh, consolidated white position that you would have found in the high school, you would have found in the library of virulent racism towards uh, the Native American peoples. Um, I suspect that if you go into some of the communities around some of the reservations, you don't even got to go near, you don't have to go near the reservations, but certainly my experience up around Ronan and the Flathead and Montana and some of the other places, um, some of the same issues exist. I know they exist in Washington State around fishing rights and so forth. Um, it, it has a mass character to it, doesn't it? It's something that's, you go to the high school and the library and everybody's there. That's one instance. Um, I th there's an, an obvious <coughs> other instance, which I don't think um, bears too much. In 1989, David Duke, who um, we shouldn't confuse ourselves and think he's of him just as a Klansman. The guy's been a Nazi for a long time. Um, uh, ran uh, for, in 1988, he ran for president in the Populist Party and, and then flipped over, became a Republican and won a state representative seat uh, in Louisiana. <clears throat> that was a fairly localized uh, phenomenon. It was in the, I think it was the 81st district when it, in Metairie, uh, Louisiana. In the next two years, he ran for US Senate and then for governor. In both instances, um, he took uh, over 50% of the white vote. Um, for state house, I mean for the Senate and governor, and he raised and spent around $2, two million in each campaign. Um, and that to me constitutes um, a mainstream a phenomenon. Um, he was no longer, we weren't talking about a kook out there. You couldn't talk about him as just a kook. You had to talk about him in some sort of um, if impact, political impact uh, on the mainstream. Um, and the people that he brought into his uh, movement were certainly everyday folks. Now, there's a myth, I think, that uh, when you get everyday folks, everyday white people in your movement, that by definition means it can't be really racist. It must be motivated by something else, um, like economics and, and so the, or d voter dissatisfaction or, uh, you know, with the Duke thing, there was a million pundits that came down and said, uh, this isn't really about race in Louisiana. It's not that we've got a bunch of angry white people on our hands. What we really have is a bunch of people who are angry at politicians, and so they're picking David Duke to express that. And you'll hear that all the time when, um, so we're, we're gonna talk about that a little bit uh, in the discussion and so forth. Um, now, there's a third instance that I wanted to bring up. But Duke, even though he raised money nationally and actually m raised more money nationally than he did in Louisiana, um, Duke really was a Louisiana phenomenon there for a little while, wasn't he? Although he, sh he sort of led the way for Pat Buchanan to come into the South. Um, there's a third thing that I'd like to uh, indicate, which is um, of a different kind. I'm trying to pick different local instances that are different in each case. The Duke thing is very different than the anti -ins Indian insurgency in uh, Wisconsin um, and different from mass white protest against desegregation in Yonkers, for example. I mean, we could go through and list, uh, you know, a couple dozen of these local things. But I think the third thing I want to uh, point to is the um, situation that Grace referred to um, in northern Idaho, which is that uh, in, during the Randy Weaver uh, uh, standoff, they're developed in uh, this uh, area where Washington State, Idaho, and Montana come together up in the panhandle there. They're developed among everyday ordinary folks that Grace would run into in the grocery store um, who were not necessarily associated with the Aryan nations. Um, a sympathy and uh, 
and support and then involvement, even if it was peripheral involvement, and certainly an association of the beliefs of the white supremacists. Um, and this happened, um, I think, through a, ver a variety of causes, and I don't want to get into it, because uh, this isn't a workshop on Randy Weaver and Ruby Ridge, but it is important to point out that, that unlike the David Duke thing, which built up over time and involved electoral machinery, and unlike the anti-Indian activity in Wisconsin, which had a specific grievance um, uh, with the, uh, around fishing rights and treaty and uh, that sort of thing, although that was building for a long time. The Randy Weaver thing directly involved um, somebody who was at the beginning of this whole process called a white supremacist, and at the end of it was called a white separatist who just wanted to be left alone. Um, and uh, that transformation uh, in the public mind is, is part of what happened in northern Idaho and opened up the door, I think, um, to uh, uh, mass support. Now, these are three localized things. I think what's happened over this period of time since the mid, late 1980s into the current period um, is that this has become transformed into a national movement and a national phenomenon, this national phenomenon. And really what we're talking about here now is not the mainstream itself. Um, uh, uh, well, we are talking about it, but we're not, t what I'm trying to describe at least initially here is not the movement of the mainstream out, although that's happened. What I'm trying to describe here is the extremists in, okay, for, for, for this part of the process. Is that clear? Yeah. Have I lost you all? Have no. I told too many stories? Um, Randy's going to have a rough time editing this video. Um, it, uh, can you, if you could write your question down and hold it for um, for five minutes. I think that there's been a specific political vehicle for this uh, phenomenon on the national level, and that's been the Pat Buchanan candidacy. Um, and the Pat Buchanan candidacy allowed a lot of the David Duke staffer volunteer types in Louisiana, for example, to get involved in the, in the political process in the mainstream of the Republican Party. Um, if you look at other parts of the uh, Pat Buchanan campaign, you will find with regular conservatives all sorts of um, people who have been in the populist party or uh, the uh, one or another of the hardcore type white supremacist organizations. You'll also find, if you remember the flap last February, if you remember Larry Pratt, um, uh, the Larry Pratt business, uh, uh, the gun owners of America, Washington inside lobbyist who had come to uh, Estes Park um, to talk about Rand the Randy Weaver incident. Um, uh, at Estes Park that, in 1992. Um, and then he became, Larry Pratt became the, one of the co-chairs of the Pat Buchanan candidacy. And that was a signal as well that that wing of um, white supremacists would feel uh, at home, although Larry Pratt wasn't part of that white supremacist wing himself. Um, he was, uh, in my opinion, sort of a messenger. He was a, a go-between character that, that uh, went back and forth. Um, an interesting thing about that Estes Park meeting is reflected in a lot of the local situations that I've described, which is that the hardcore bad guys who had seen themselves frozen outside the political system had made a conscious decision, a very conscious decision, to bury their differences with people that were more mainstream conservative and um, bury their differences and get involved in the Pat Buchanan candidacy as a way of doing that. Um, and in Estes Park, they talked about burying their differences, the white supremacists burying their differences um, in order uh, to um, build an alliance with the Christian right. Uh, and that was, uh, that was a speech given by Chris Temple at that meeting where he, he, he talked specifically about this you know, change in strategy that he wanted to see. 
So we're talking about a strategic change, a conscious decision that these characters had made. This wasn't something that just fell in their lap. Um, all right, is that clear? Are we clear on that much? Um, now, I just want to raise something here, which is that the Pat Buchanan candidacy didn't become this vehicle just because Pat Buchanan's a bad guy. Um, because as all the media, pun media pundits will tell you, and people that will tell you, Pat's not a personal hater, see? And so that sort of throws everybody off the balance. They'd, everybody had gone to dinner at Pat's house. He was a gracious host. Um, he was fun to be around, told good stories, better than mine. That was a laugh line. You're supposed to laugh. Um, he's a good guy. The, there was a philosophical or political tendency that had pushed the Buchanan can candidacy. And um, that's a word that's sort of hard to understand, but it's called paleoconservatives. H how many people have ever heard of that before? Yesterday. Yes. Oh, yeah, I said it yesterday. <laughs> I cheated. I cheated. It's the dinosaur crowd. Just think of it as the dinosaur crowd. Um, the cavemen, right. Uh, the paleoconservatives um, distinguish themselves from the rest of the conservative movement by their fascination with issues of race and culture, racial integrity, national integrity. They're the main philosophical proponents of the anti-immigrant uh, stuff. They're the ones who have latched onto the Confederate flag battles into the South. The, and they are the, uh, the brain trust, if you will, behind the Buchanan candidacy. And so they were able to m meld a kind of economic nationalism around tariffs and stuff with a cultural, racial cultural appeal around issues like immigration, affirmative action, uh, abortion rights, and so forth. Um, and these paleoconservatives have started to reach out to the white supremacists philosophically, and that is what happened at that Atlanta meeting that I op that story that I opened up with is that meeting that Sam Dixon was at. You remember him from the beginning? Mm -hmm. That meeting was really engineered, brought together, and consisted of this paleoconservative brain trust. Now they followed up this year again in 1996. This is 1996, isn't it? Um, that first meeting was in 94. Sorry. Uh, 1996, they did a similar meeting in 1996 in Louisville. Now, there was a change in the Louisville meeting. Um, in, that, in the first meeting in Atlanta, where these professors had gotten together and moved this whole discussion into the, a different arena, in the second meeting in 1996 in Louisville, they brought a man down from Canada named Philippe Rushton. How many of you have heard of Philippe Rushton? Um, he's a, uh, a, a professor at the University of Western Ontario, I, I recall, um, who uh, has uh, conducted research proving that um, white people are smarter because they have white genes. You know, this white genes IQ stuff, you know, this. And, and actually, you could probably make a good case that white people are dumber because of these white genes, but um, uh, that's my bias, I'm sorry. Um, uh, but uh, but here, here, we've got the, here we've got, taking this out of the uh, cultural realm, we're, now we're taking it into biological determinism, which of course is the heart and soul of the white supremacist movement is the notion that biology is destiny and that, bio, bio, that everything that happens in society is biologically ordered and so forth. And so what you have is even a movement of the main, not mainstream, but these academic types that you know, have brought Sam Dixon into the mainstream. You have two years later a leap over to an even harder position away from sort of cultural, cult, things being culturally determined to things being biologically determined, a sort of a genetic, and that's the theme that dominated that Louisville meeting. Now, something happened between 1994 meeting and the 1996 meeting that made the guys, because those guys in 1994 believed that stuff, they just didn't talk about it. 
But in 1996, they felt like they could talk about it. And the reason they could talk about it, anybody got an idea? You're not allowed to answer. Anybody got an idea why they felt like they could talk about it? Before elections? Before elections? 94 elections? 94 elections? Nah. Brian? Bell curve. Bell curve. You got it. Brian got an A in that class. Um, uh, the Bell Curve, the publication of The Bell Curve by Charles Murray and Richard Herrnstein. And while you can argue, I think, and we've had discussions about this, that The Bell Curve didn't change the mass white mind about genetics. What it did do is make possible people make, it changed the nature of the debate. It opened up the possibility that people could come in with this biological determinism and it would be a poll of opinion that would get a fair review in the, among the elite intellectual centers of, of public opinion. And that people would disagree with it, obviously. We haven't gone off the edge yet. Um, but that a, tr a transformation did occur, and the oak, the green light on this transformation between 94 and 96 was the bell curve. I'm sort of right on target. Um, let's have a little few minutes discussion about this thing. I've tried to trace for you, I think, a, tra uh, a transformation process, something that didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen because all the turnips fell out of the back of the truck. Um, it didn't happen be uh, because people are uh, inherently evil and do the most evil thing possible. It happened because there was a political transformation that went on over several years, went from a local to a national process. Um, I'm not a geneticist. I'm not even a biology student. Um, uh, so I can't tell you independently that, you know, about it. Um, I think, I'll, I'll tell you from the very beginning, I think race is a socially constructed phenomenon. It's not something that, that uh, is biological. So to, what you've done is you've taken a socially constructed phenomenon and given a biological meaning and so, and then tested it. Um, so it's like um, trying to, you know, measure water as it's coming through your fingers, I think. It's, it's something that doesn't exist, and then they've measured it. Um, that's my opinion. The, the, most of the mainstream people, like Stephen Jay Gould and so forth, say the data is all wrong. And I think that they're probably right, that the data is all wrong. Um, but there is a link between um, this funding uh, foundation called the Pioneer Fund which was a, um, set up by Nazi sympathizers in the United States in the 1930s, eugenicists, people who believed in the upbreeding of the white race, um, and the Pioneer Fund, and the funding of Murray and Herrnstein and the, uh, the, the research that did that book. So um, it's sort of an old-fashioned bad job. Um, now, uh, Murray himself, how many people here know the other book that he's responsible for? Susan, you're not allowed to answer. You're not allowed to answer either. Um, well, it's the, it was the, the Bible of the Reagan administration called Losing Ground. Um, and it was his attack, that was his attack on welfare and on, the wel you know, on social benefits and so forth like that. And he came up with the notion that what happened is, is that We've created this underclass, and I don't want to go into all his silliness. But the, the point here is, is that he had a hearing. <coughs> Charles Murray already had a hearing, and that the argument that he made in the 1980s about welfare became public policy this year. You know? um, and I, that's my concern about the bell curve, is not its reception this year but it's reception um, 10 years down the road. When people are looking for a reason to explain the obvious failure of, you know, blah, 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 and, uh, and we've tried everything, we passed these laws, we gave them welfare, we did this for them, we did that for them, and now the, the only reason is it's clear it must be in the biology. 
So that's my concern about that because he's had some success with that in the past. One of the things I wanted to ask and just sort of address generally, and this came out as well in some of the symposium stuff yesterday, is the use of misinformation and misrepresentation, which becomes then accepted as, as truth, which is the, the bell curve is a very good example of that, that a man has written a book whose science is very faulty and then can suddenly five or ten years be considered fact. And I think that a lot of people's comments about why they're here in terms of information they just deal with in their daily lives and how do we confront that constant barrage of misinformation about who actually is an undocumented worker or what is actually happening with, with other types of things economically in the country, with welfare, what have you. And I think to me that's the biggest problem that I see and I really feel like I'd like to hear some feedback on that because that is what's happening in the mainstream. People are hearing things that are blatantly false and yet the media is not talking about it, we can't get information out and we have this, this building up of a myth in this culture. Well, I think there are other voices. I mean, you're the other voice. Um, and uh, I think what you've just uh, put forward is, is, a, is the, really the second part of this, which is this discussion, which is how do we organize around this. Um, and I think providing a alt alternate information is, is a one, obviously, one good place to start. Um, is, uh, and there are books out there and there's, but that responded to the bell curve, for example. Um, and there were, um, in each one of these instances that I described in the local arena, there were uh, people who stood up in their communities, and I think it bears mentioning, in the anti, in this mainstream, and it sh can change the situation. It can change the situation. For example, in the Wisconsin situation, with the anti-Indian violence, which became very widespread and mainstream, there was a local group of uh, people who were Indian supporters, a local group of white people who were Indian supporters, who, um, and I think this is really a white people's problem, get, to sort of start with that, is that this is, a lot of times people think of anti-racist organizing as something that people uh, of color should do, and actually, it's something that white people should do. And um, so this is directed at you who are the socially constructed white people here. Um, uh, so uh, for right now. Um, but it seems to me that in, in the Wisconsin situation, people said, we're not gonna let this happen. They went down to the, the docks where the fishing was going on and they held a vigil there, a peace vigil and said, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna let this happen, we're not gonna let these attacks. They stood between the attackers and the Indians, okay? They also took pictures of the mobs, they publicized it, they got you know, press around it, and I would argue to you that, that the press will respond when you get out a, a good message like this, you know, they, they will respond. In the case of, of the David Duke phenomenon, now it is true that the black people of Louisiana saved United States Senate uh, from having its uh, uh, Nazi uh, in, in, the, in the chambers there. Um, but it was organizing among a, a significant minority of white people that changed the balance there. Lance, here, over here, that you, some of you heard talk yesterday, um, uh, they created a political movement in opposition to it and they spoke up and they ha got, had a discussion. Um, in, the, in the case of the Randy Weaver, it's been a lot more difficult. Grace will tell you that standing up and speaking out in the Idaho panhandle as an average citizen has been a difficult task and they've been intimidated. I think that's why we're here today. And when um, when um, I talk with Bill about this, Wasmith about this conference, he says, we're going to Spokane because we need to speak to people in eastern Washington, northern Idaho, and western Montana where the, we're having this trouble. And um, I think if we organize around this, get out information, um, you can begin the process of, of rolling this back a little bit. Hi, I'm from Spokane. I run a, the Northwest Fair Housing Alliance, which is a housing civil rights organization. And I just want to agree with what you said. I think it's extremely difficult here in Spokane, it's a one newspaper town, 
um, to get the truth or any response before the community. And um, I'm participating in every way I can humanly think of in, in demonstrations, rallies, conversations, um, reaching out to, to the media and to the Inlander, which is the, the sort of alternative press. But the bottom line is that what I see happening is those of us who do that are repeatedly dismissed by the media as a small, radical, weird-looking, <laughs> and I can put my business suit on and do my thing, you know, but the point is I, I think that's just an overwhelming problem. The, I know people that I think of as really nice people who work in environments in which in the workplace Rush Limbaugh plays all day. And, and they, they believe it. I mean, they're, they're not both bad people, but to actually sort of lift up the weight of that sort of one paper, one view, everything is okay here in Spokane, there really isn't a problem. It's just a massive undertaking. I'm sure welcome advice and counsel from anyone else here who has successfully countered that. I really have to second that. I'm from the Valley of Montana, and we have very little but uh, it's become commonplace and in fact it seems to be the only uh, uh, prominent response you might say to the issue is the far right and you can counter that privately or, you know, on your own but you're just overwhelmed uh, this is a nice place to live you know Kathleen Billing? pardon? you know Kathleen Billing? no I don't, I'm Dallas Billing but um uh, it's, it's real frustrating and we get this hey this is a nice place to live it's extremely comfortable and we came here from LA if you want diversity you go to LA you get out of here I mean, it's, it's frustrating this woman is back and then I'm going to try and bring this back yeah. I, I just like to say that there, there are Indian country today newspaper just opened the Northwest Bureau here in town and that um, there's also a black newspaper starting up called the Africa. Yes, I'm aware of that. Uh, it's a start. I had another question, and that has to do with being an at um, I'm at a community college, and people want to do something to combat the sort of academic uh, aura that's coming around this. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that without further legitimizing it by making it uh, a legitimate academic issue? In what way can you do it that and he doesn't further legitimize it by bringing it into the academic uh, uh, <laughs> 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 Well, let's get some more of this out because then I'll tr this woman in the back. Um, I'm from Everett, Washington, from Belltown, and it's the Bobbish County. Excuse me, can I ask you and others to speak up? It's really hard to hear. I'm from Everett, Washington, <laughs> from Belltown, and we have our problems in Snohomish County, as many of you might know. We have one newspaper, and um, we use the letters to the editor on a regular basis. Now, we can only publish one letter every six months um, per person, per person. So sometimes some of us will come up with the idea of a letter, and then we get somebody else that they haven't heard their name send the letter in. We try and educate, not attack, because sometimes we attack because we want that discussion. So we use two or three different kinds of strategy. And believe it or not, the editorial board will sometimes, when I send a letter in, say, you know, you've sent too many in, but we like this. And so they began to explore it. Um, one of the things I try never to do, this is a mom thing, is use negative um, <coughs> discipline. So anything that begins to tell more of at least an unbiased position, I immediately call that writer and thank them and tell them how wonderful they are. It's like positive reinforcement. And we actually now have a writer who stays right on top of that. He tries to stay neutral so he stays alive. But <laughs> every single article, and even if it's once a week, I call him and thank him. He's kind of getting bored with my thanking him, but I know better. You know. Um, who, who hasn't talked yet? I just wanted to respond to my head valley. I am part of my head reservation.
Washington Human Rights Coalition and Kathy Billy. And I'm just sorry that Kathy isn't here. That's Next weekend, uh, there will be the annual culture fair to be held in Rodan, in which all cultures and all races in the area are invited to do presentations. And it also goes into the schools and asks children <coughs> to um, put out poems and stories in regard to racial issues. And so I would lift this up to you as a way to influence the public. Um, she also, on a monthly basis, this group sponsors speakers such as yourself. I have been up here a long time ago. So, a couple different times. Yeah. You speak up, please. We have a candidate running commissioner in the in November 5th. And this wife is a very, very um, knowledgeable about campaigning, and, and he doesn't say anything about his beliefs or anything like that. Um, you know, he just smiles, and, and, and they talk about, about the taxes. Now, and, and how do you expose them in a forum, for instance? How would you expose voting rights? But he has not ever run for Well, let, let me, before we... Um, go over the edge here in the depression. Um, uh, let, let me uh, try and, and offer some insights. And let me tell you, if I was um, smart enough to answer these questions, I'd be rich instead of famous. Um, uh, so um, I don't know the answers. And I don't know that we all, you know, that at this point we know all the answers to these, some of these things. Some of them are, are uh, are uh, difficult, um, but uh, I think you can point to some things here, and this is, maybe we'll have a pop quiz next year on this. Um, but I think that one of the things you have to do is, um, in all these instances, is you have to find the available resources, because um, they exist. I mean, you're here, right? And so there are a lot of, resources in this conference um, of people who um, are publishing different kinds of things, organizations that exist in your region. Um, in the Kalispell, um, you should really get in touch with the people down in Ronan. Um, and then you should get in touch with the people in Helena at the Montana Human Rights Network. They're very good folks. They know what they're doing. Um, and uh, build yourself into the ongoing uh, organizations and so forth that are doing. Bring Susan to camp up there to talk um, uh, to, oh, at one of the churches. Um, you got the resources right here to do some of the beginning stuff. Um, you guys, if you don't know each other, um, get together. Um, so I think there are in the room, you know, and in the, uh, in the uh, conference here, there are a significant number of resources. But that's not just, I think that's not going to solve all of it, obviously. Um, I think you have to pick your target. Uh, I can't stand Rush Limbaugh. I just, you know, although I listen to him occasionally um, just to keep up. Um, but I think a lot of people actually don't like Rush, Rush Limbaugh anymore, and he's, you know, God knows what will happen to him. But the point is, is that if Rush Limbaugh is what's bothering you, um, forget it. You know, pick a, a target that you can deal with in your local community or in, in your region, your area there, and try and focus on that target. And pick your target well. Um, so that you're not all spread over the map. I think that that's a problem on our side. Actually, in 1994, at that talk there, the talk Sam Dixon did was a brilliant, brilliant piece on us. Um, it was a brilliant piece on us in which he said, these leftists and liberals and progressives, they've got a nervous condition. They have to go to a meeting every night they have to talk forever. They talk to themselves all the time. They're in this coalition, then they're in that coalition. He says, 
in this talk, he says, read the Creative Loafing, which is the Atlanta newspaper, uh, alternative newspaper, and you'll find, you know, the, the vegetarian da 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 for El Salvador or whatever. He says, they're just too busy. And I think you're too busy. And so I would say, you know, get less busy and more serious about one thing. Um, and really try and focus your energies a little bit. And then find people that you can focus your energies with and pick your target well. Um, and then you'll achieve some small victories there. And you might pick your target in consultation with the available resources. For example, in Spokane, it might make sense for you to pick the same target as the people down in Kootenai County or the people up in Bonner Springs, um, Bonner's Ferry, Bonner Springs in Kansas. Um, uh, but you know, pick your, you know, get together with them and pick, you know, and talk about it and pick your targets together and and choose. You might hold one. Um, okay. Now, um, then after you've picked your target, find the appropriate vehicle. If you can only get one letter to the editor in and you can't get news coverage, then that's not the appropriate vehicle. Stop worrying about it. That's, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the beginning point, not the end point of your search. Stop worrying about it. Find an appropriate vehicle. If it's a political candidate you're worried about, uh, get active politically. Uh, form a political action committee. Um, you don't have to. You don't have to stay to this. Uh, just stand up and and uh, moralize kind of nonprofit thing that's being done. Get out there and get in the political. Get out there in the political trenches and work to defeat a candidate. Go door to door. Get other people to go door to door. It's you know that's the American way and it works. And so find the appropriate vehicle. If it's in the library, and you're concerned about the the uh, the discussion there. Um, You've got to commit, you know, you can't get a library lot levy passed because the, the bozos don't want to read books. Um, find, yourself a, a, find yourself a committee to, to support the library. If it's in academia, that's a tricky one um, because of this legitimate, the legitimation question that was raised is that if you're going to debate the bad guys, then you elevate their position uh, uh, by giving it legitimacy. Well, I would argue to you that the whole thrust of this workshop has said that they've already got legitimacy, a certain amount of legitimacy. Uh, uh, stop worrying about that aspect and start talking about it. Get out there and put your point of view across. And if it's in, in a community college, then get some other professors or some students together and form, you know, a a committee and hold some educational forums and and uh, uh, publish your own newsletter or whatever it takes in that setting um, to get that across. Um, so uh, find the appropriate vehicle. And then the fourth thing, um, this is sort of the, those of you who have heard me talk before know that I have t two sayings. One is that um, Nazis are people too, and which is important to remember. And fighting Nazis can be fun. <laughs> and this isn't going to be solved tomorrow. This isn't going to be solved tomorrow. So you need to have fun while you're doing this. You need to enjoy yourself. You need to. This is something that's going to consume your time. You're not going to go you know, um, and to the movies as much maybe or whatever. <laughs> this is something that, so you're in this for the long haul, get prepared to do it for the long haul and, and think of it as fun. I mean, you're here, you gave up your Saturday. Um, unless you're doing penance for something, you're here, <laughs> which we all are, which we all are. Um, have fun while you're doing it, yeah. Risk of being cliche, uh, I wanted to say that in terms of what you just defined as four steps, I find that there is no better vehicle than that internet. Um, and I had 
just thinking about how we could link up better from a, a regional standpoint with something like the Washington State Human Rights Commission as the as the regional headquarters with a homepage that everybody could link into and get get information, and then maybe sub-regions where we can communicate. Because getting the word out about what's going on is the hardest thing from one region to the next, one county to the next. And uh, what I have discovered on the internet that is blatantly available is just basically surprised me to no end. You should do a workshop at next year's convention because you're talking to a Luddite here. I, I'm still trying to get my royal portable to work. Go on. Focus on uh, creating our organizations, our movement, by drawing in new people. I think that you you just a really significant point that we're all too busy and we're all trying to do it all. And there are a lot of people in our communities who believe what we do and that we don't have the time to draw them in because it takes more work to draw new people. I think that's something as a movement we have to look at the long run. I, I think to do to do less is to do more, to do it better. Issue. I, that's what they have done. You bet. They have brought together diverse groups. We, I think, going, and I know there have been attempts to go beyond just human rights activists to environmental rights and so on, you know, other groups to bring in and to pick our targets to do less better, I think, is important. Right. Oh, my, my, my. Get this gentleman in the beard and then. Oh, uh, qu question Where would you put Alan Croswell vis a vis David Duke? I mean, truthfully speaking, one degree, two degrees, the mainstream anchor David Duke in the state of Washington. I don't, you I don't, I don't know enough. I don't know enough. I mean, it might be <clears throat> useful to, to look at the Louisiana fallout. Um, there's a lot of this Ellen Craswell types around now. Um, the guy who's now the governor of Louisiana, Mike Foster, is it Foster? is, um, and certainly the governor of Mississippi, Kirk Fordyce, is, I think, a more appropriate kind of a comparison in that you've got somebody for whom, you know, racial issues are uh, motivating factors uh, that um, w ran for governor and won. Um, it's a little bit different than David Duke. Da for David Duke, politics was sort of a thing he wanted to do if he could, if he could have done the same thing by by, by being, you know, dressing in orange and, and setting up a commune in Oregon, uh, he would have done that. It was just an opportunity for him. Um, others are politicians. Uh, excuse me, right before you take care of the question, uh, we're going to end this on time. We're going to end this on time, and it's 11 o'clock. Thank you for your attention. Um, if Mr. Zeskin is um, willing, <laughs> if there are any people who want to make and talk more, um, I'm sure that you can stick around. But for the rest of you, you might want to move along to the next workshop you've chosen because we are going to keep this on the Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>